Uh, where, I, where I wanted to go tonight, actually, especially going into Thanksgiving week, was um, is actually kind of illustrated by, by John being in the hospital because, you know, you, when we're presented with another person, when we have an opportunity, I mean, so many, so many things, you know, tonight in the manifestations, you know, I'm, I'm close to you, ask me, and then Ricky and his, and his manifestations, same, ask me things, talk to me, speak to the young people. And really, this, this is great guidance for us and things that we need to continually to push on because, you know, as, as you guys know, I've been studying in Samuel a lot lately. And when David was talking to Jonathan and Jonathan was clueless because Saul had hidden from Jonathan that Saul wanted to kill David, but David knew it. And so when, when David and Jonathan were talking in the field and Jonathan said, no, no, I, my father, if my father wanted to kill you, he would have told me. And then David said, <clears throat> surely there, there is only a step between me and death. And, and that can really be true in things like, like the COVID and, and a car wreck or all kinds of different things um, can, can occur. Um, you know, you can get, especially now with everybody being shut in and being separated and being masked up. Uh, I know that, to, uh, let's see, was it last night that one of the networks did a, a TV special on domestic violence and that domestic violence is up at least 50% right now, you know, and some of those people end up quite, quite dead, you know, and they didn't start the evening out that way. And the next thing you know, you're in a fight, somebody grabs a kitchen knife and you're dead type of thing. So it, death really, in fact, let's just go to the book of Job, uh, Job chapter six, please. Um, and of course, here's Job and talk about a step from death. He didn't, you know, we looking back, know that Job lost his wealth, he lost his health, he lost his family, um, but he did not die. But when Job was talking to his three friends, he didn't know that. He didn't know he was going to recover um, and, and be able to regain his, his health and his, his wealth and have more children and that kind of thing. And so um, the in verse 11 of Job chapter six, he says, what is my strength that I should wait? What is my end that I should be patient? Is my strength the strength of stones or is my flesh of bronze? In other words, how much can I take? And then verse 13 is so powerful. I was so moved when I read this verse the other week. Is it not that I have no help in me? And that's really true. You and I are pretty weak on our own. You know, we, we cannot determine the day of our death. Sometimes we can't. I mean, it, it helps if we keep a positive attitude, but does that keep you alive? Um, not all the time, for sure. And so then who is our help? Well, the, the Bible is very clear. My help is from the Lord, from Yahweh. Then Yahweh and the Lord Jesus are our help. And so we, we need to learn to tap into that. We have a big brother, Jesus Christ. We have a wonderful, loving God, God. And, and it's like Job says, you know, I, <laughs> on my own, I'm, I'm pretty weak, you know. And, and, uh, but, but I know that there's a God in heaven. I know there's a Lord in heaven. And that's where our help is. And, and we're, we're all the same. All of us people are the same. You know, we don't have help within ourselves. We have help in the Lord. And we can point people toward that. Now, let's go to Hebrews, please, chapter 4. Because in, in uh, talking about, well, let's see, let me get to Hebrews myself here. In talking about um, then going to God for help. You know, how do, how do we do that? And then what we're going to look at is how we go to God for help and some of the parts that Jesus Christ played and allowing us to get help. So it starts out in verse 12, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, fabulous verse here <clears throat> about God, or I'm sorry, the Word of God. And it says, for the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword even piercing as far as the dividing of soul and spirit, 
you know, and, and, you know, both of them are giving life to the body and that kind of thing. It's very, very, no human could divide that. Dividing soul and spirit of both joints and marrow. And he's able to judge the considerations and intentions of the heart. What are you just thinking about versus what are you intending? And, and God is able to make that judgment. That's one of the things we can't do. That's why God needs to be there on the day of judgment. If we're going to have fair judgment, that God judges that. So what the scripture does here is it, it kind of sets up the power and ability of the word of God. And of course, God behind his word. And so verse 13 then says, and there's not a creature. And, <laughs> and, and I, I love that. And um because it could say human and it doesn't. It just it it, um, it 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 puts us in the category of creatures. We're just um, we're just simply his creation. You could also for creature you could you could use the word creation. There's not a created thing. Verse thirteen. There's not a creature created thing unexposed before him. Because that word is so sharp, and he is so sharp behind it, and there's not anybody that's that's unexposed. Nobody's hiding anything from God. Now, if we settle that in our heart, then that's a leg up on being honest. You see, if 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 I if I am driven to my knees and I am completely honest before God, and I'm honest about the fact that there's no help in me, and I'm honest about the fact that he is my help, and I'm honest about the fact that Jesus is my salvation, and I'm honest about the fact that then I have a responsibility before God to help others come to everlasting life. But Romans 7, it, it, I don't have a responsibility to become perfect because it's never going to happen. That's not my responsibility. <laughs> we just do the best we can. And every creature is exposed before him. None are unexposed. But all things are naked and laid open before the eyes of whom, uh, to, of him to whom we must give an account. And here we're looking toward the day of judgment. Verse 14, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, by the way, we're going to follow that. Wherever, wherever Jesus is, we're going to get to go there too in the rapture. Pass through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold on firmly to our confession. And, you know, in other words, don't waver, don't wobble. There's no need. God's God. We just hold firmly to what we, what we say about him, to our confession. Verse 15, for we don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus Christ has been where we are. Verse 16, therefore, let us draw near to the throne of grace with open and honest speech in order to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of our need. And we had the manifestations tonight. Come to me, ask me, talk to me, tell me things. And, um, Sadly, in, in many translations, the, the Greek word parahesia gets translated boldness. It let us draw near to the throne of grace with boldness. And in, in American culture, that gives the wrong impression. Because, you know, you, you guys know what it is to be bold in American culture. You know, you got to speak up. You got to wear bright colored clothing. You got to stand out. You got to, you know, you've got to be aggressive in what you do. And that is not at all what the Greek word parahesia meant in the, in the Greek culture. Um, it, was, it was more about just being frank, being open, being honest. It just said <laughs> that there's not a creature unexposed. All things are naked and laid open. Okay, if that's our situation, why would we not be completely open and honest with God about our feelings and our prayers? And, you know, of course, the devil doesn't want people to be open and honest. So he starts, um, he starts little rumors like, well, you know, if you talk to God and you, you sound negative, then that, that influences what happens in life. I just don't see that in the scripture. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> I don't see that. What I see is that we're supposed to be honest with God, then we're supposed to find things to be thankful for, and we're supposed to focus on the things that are good and profitable and those kind of things. But, you know, if you're sick, it doesn't help to not tell God about it. Hey, God, I'm, I'm, I'm sick. I need help. Hey, God, I need money. Hey, God, I need a job. Hey, God, I, because God's saying, come to me, ask me. And the question then in the culture, how did parahesia, which means to be frank and honest, how did that get translated in bold, is boldness? And the answer is simple, beautiful, and sad. Because it's sad because generally speaking in a culture, if you tell a superior, whether it's his, uh, your boss, whether it's your, your parents, whether it's um, in the military, somebody that's a commander over you, whatever it is, if you tell somebody how you really feel, generally speaking, you suffer for it. You know, you go up to the boss and you say, you know, you're, you're doing a bad job. Well, I mean, that's open and honest speech. And he may be doing a terrible job, but he doesn't think so, and you get the consequence. So in the in the culture, it um, being honest, op using open and honest speech, required a level of boldness, and that's that's how that morph was made, that nuance from being frank to being bold. But you and I know, in the when we're in the context here of God. What he wants from us is open and honest speech. And open and honest speech begins with open and honest thinking. And, and so we've got to be, you know, honest about our feelings. And a lot of times there's no help. You know, it's, it, it, we're broken people in a broken world. And, you know, we can, I, it, you know, we go to God, God, the world is broken. Yeah, and it, it's not going to be fixed but we can at least express it. And, and you know, that, that allows us then to be honest and we wanna be honest with God when we ask. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter five. And because of our, our um, weaknesses and stuff, we needed somebody to pay for our sin. And 2 Corinthians five in verse 21, we'll back it up to verse 20 so that we get the full context. Um, but 2 Corinthians 5.21 is, is very important, points us back to the Old Testament, and that's where we're going next. But in verse 20, it says, therefore, we're ambassadors on behalf of Christ. I'm going back to Ricky Zidane's prophecy tonight about speaking to people, speaking to people. I guarantee you, in the weeks between now and Christmas, you are going to have the opportunity to speak to people. Pre-think it. Think what you're going to say. Think that you're standing in line behind somebody and, the, you know, it's a slow line or something. What, you know, uh, are, are you prepared type of thing so that you're not trying to invent something? Now, if the Lord gives you a revelation, great, you know, but um, but just be, be aware, hey, these opportunities are going to become, you don't want to be caught flat-footed. What could you say? That kind of thing. So we're ambassadors on behalf of Christ, God, as it were, making his appeal through us. Here it is, straight out, God's making his appeal through us. We implore on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's what we, what we implore people to do. Please be reconciled to God. Why? Because we want him to live forever. And then verse 21, he, God, made him who did not know sin, which is Jesus, to be a sin offering on our behalf. If we translate harmatia is sin offering as it's translated many, many times in the Septuagint, then, uh, then we can understand the verse. If you translate, it astounds me that even in the modern versions, I mean, come, I, I feel like, you know, sometimes I feel like walking into a room of theologians and just going, what's wrong with you people? You know, I mean, gosh, how, it's, how does this stuff continue? You know, there's not any theologian on the planet that reads a little Greek and a little Hebrew knows that the word harmatia was used throughout the Old Testament for the sin offering. All you got to do is look it up in the Septuagint. It's there over and over and over again. It makes no sense 
to say that Jesus became sin. How does a human being become sin? What does that even mean? It's, it creates a nonsense verse that just, um, it doesn't tie into the Old Testament. It, it doesn't make any sense in English. It doesn't make any logical sense. And so here you have an incredibly powerful verse that ties the Old Testament with the action of Christ, with the consequence of that action in your life and my life. And somehow or other, by a mistranslation, the whole blasted thing falls apart. Instead, we've got God took the one who didn't know sin, meaning Jesus Christ never sinned, and he made him a sin offering on our behalf. And now immediately, I know all of you are thinking, oh, wow, isn't that like Leviticus 4 and 5, the sin offering and the guilt offering? Yeah, you're all thinking that, I know. <laughs> but anyway, it's still there, whether you are or not. And, and so you've got these sin offerings throughout the Old Testament and here, but they were so, um, they, were, they were really powerless because you offered these sin offerings, but then you still had to be judged for whether you sinned or not. <laughs> Whereas with our sin offering with Jesus, we believe in Jesus Christ and our sin's done. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's atoned for, period. We are heaven bound. So, so Christ is a sin offering on our behalf so that through union with him, we would become the righteousness of God. So here's God who's righteous, and here's we who are sinners, and then Christ is a sin offering. We go through that. The sin offering covers our sin, and we come out the other side is righteous is, with the righteousness of God. I mean, it's, it's, it's just absolutely astounding what's going on here. So when and, and here, with Christ being the sin offering and our sin covered, do, am I happy that I sin and make mistakes and stuff? No. But, but what can I do? I still know that spiritually I have the righteousness of God, and I can walk in and I can talk to God. I can thank him for sending Jesus Christ. I can thank him for imputing to me righteousness that I don't deserve, and I can talk to him about all the places I screw up because I know they're covered by the blood of Christ. And I can be frank and open like Hebrews says. Let's go back to Leviticus chapter 1. Because if we then, if we want to tie the Old Testament uh, to, the, to the New Testament and what we just read, let's go back to Leviticus chapter 1. And here in Leviticus chapter 1, and I, I, I love this because I really believe, it, well, we'll just read verse one. It says, and Yahweh called to Moses and spoke to him out of the tent of meeting saying, so you've got the, the, the Israel is camped in the wilderness. They're all camped in a big, huge kind of circly square thing all around the tabernacle of God, which is in the middle. And by Leviticus chapter one, the, the tabernacle, or it's also called the tent of meeting, um, the, 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 that's in the center, and so Moses is doing whatever he's doing. I mean, he might be visiting somebody, he might be, who knows what Moses is doing, but God wants to talk to Moses, and so he spoke to him, and here's this big voice that comes booming out of the tent of meeting, and that's one of the things that the children of Israel would, would be exposed to, and so he called to him, spoke to him, and then, of course, Moses would come and talk to God, verse 2, and God says, speak to the children of Israel and tell them, when any one of you approaches with an approach offering to Yahweh from the livestock, you may approach with your approach offering from the herd or from the flock. Now, um, this is our translation approach offering is um, different than the mainstream uh, sometimes it, you'll say when any of you approaches with an offering or comes near with an offering, the, pro the, the, the problem that we have in English is we don't use the vocabulary the same way they did in Hebrew. In Hebrew, the word approaches, any one of you approaches, it's a verb to approach or to draw close or to draw near. The same word as a noun was, was the offering that you approached with. But if you translate, so you've got, you've got um, uh, 
the two words karab and I'm thinking trying to think of the verb, but when when you have the the same word, one a noun and one a verb in Hebrew, it becomes very clear. You approach with this approach thing, this thing that allows you to approach. So you have the verb that you approach, and then you're holding the thing, the noun thing that allows you to approach. So we translated an approach offering. When you say, when any of you comes near or approaches with an offering, then the English reader doesn't get the fact that it is, it is that offering that even allows you to approach. And, and God was, in the Old Testament, God was very approachable. And then, then we could read through, and you can follow in the translation of the REB, because we've trans, every time it appears, we've translated an approach offering through the, the Pentateuch so that, so that you could see it. Uh, it becomes very important. Let's take a look at, at Exodus chapter 27. Um, is that where I want to go? Yeah, Exodus chapter 27. Um, and I want to go to verse 18 because in contrast, here's, here's Jesus who opened the way for us so that Hebrews 4 can now say, approach the throne of God with frankness of speech. And what we want to do is get a, a thankful feeling for how really unique that is. Because you could not do that in the Old Testament. God was, was very separate. So here in Exodus chapter 27, uh, in fact, there's a whole bunch of verses, where, uh, a bunch of chapters rather, where God is describing the details of the tabernacle to Moses. You had to build this and this, and here are the colors, and here's what things are to be made of, and this is the size it's supposed to be, blah, 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 blah. And so... Uh, Exodus chapter 27, all the pillars of the court, that's the court of the tabernacle around, are to be filleted, filleted whatever it is, with silver. Um, their hooks of silver, their sockets of bronze. The length of the court is to be 100 cubits, that's 150 feet. Uh, the breadth, 50 everywhere, 50 be 75 feet. So the, the tabernacle courtyard is 150 feet long, 75 feet wide. And then it says in the height, five cubits of fine twin twined linen and their sockets of bronze. So you have this huge curtain surrounding the tabernacle and the curtain is five cubits high. Well, that's seven and a half feet. Well, there are very few people in, in even in the world today that are that tall. And I guarantee you there weren't any Israelites that tall. <laughs> <laughs> average Israelite was probably closer to five feet, maybe five foot five on some occasions, that kind of thing, which is why Saul, who was a real aberration, could be a full head and shoulder above all the rest of the Israelites, because they just frankly weren't that tall. And so, you know, seven and a half feet, you, you put a curtain of seven and a half feet around the tabernacle, you might as well build a wall as high as, as the Empire State Building. They simply, frankly, couldn't see over it. So you hear all this goings on, you hear the priests and the Levites, and they're in there, they're in the courtyard, they're doing stuff, they're talking, yakking it up, blah, blah, blah doing things, burning sacrifices, whatever. And, and you see the smoke coming up from the sacrifices, you smell the smell of the sacrifices, you see the priests carrying in wood, or the Levites, the Levites carrying in wood and carrying out ashes, and then carrying in an olive oil, and then and all that stuff. And, and yet it's what's going on in there is completely closed off to you. God just, I'm, you know, God's message very simply was, I'm too holy for you stay out. And then God simply kind of says, well, I'll tell you what, I'll make an exception. You can approach me with an approach offering. And that's what Leviticus is about. So we, so God sets up the approach offering. And if you have the approach offering, then you could approach God. And if you didn't have the approach offering, if you didn't do things quite right, things could get really, really um, uh dicey to say the least. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 10. Uh, here's Aaron, the high priest. Aaron had two, had four sons. 
uh, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. And so here in Leviticus chapter 10, and we'll start in verse 1, it says, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, okay, let me translate Nadab and Abihu, you know, the sons of Aaron, the high priest, who thought, because they were the children of the high priest, they had special privileges with God, they each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it, and oops, offered strange fire before Yahweh that he had not commanded them. <laughs> that's that's, a, that's a, a type of gnosis, figure type of gnosis for he had commanded them not to do that. So Nadab and Abihu basically hears God saying, you know, eh, I'm really holy. And if you're going to be around me, you got to do things really right. Like if you're going to approach, approach with a approach offering and you got to make sure you do things right. And Nadab and Abihu just blew it off. And they, they're going to just do things their way around God. And verse 2, it didn't work out real well. Verse 2, fire came out from before Yahweh and devoured them. Oh, <laughs> just very, very simple, very straightforward. It devoured them, uh, and they died before Yahweh. And what, you know, as we, as we see this and we walk away from this, you know, what is a lesson here? The lesson is that... If the, two, if the two older sons of the high priest couldn't just do what they wanted to around God, what about ordinary people? You know, when, when we're talking about witnessing to people uh, that we run into this holiday season, trying to turn them from darkness to light, or as 2 Corinthians 5 says, speaking, be reconciled to God, um, this is... Um, the importance of this can't be overstated. We can't promise that somebody's going to live till the next day. You know, they could they could die of a heart attack that night. They could die in a car wreck while they're running to the 7-Eleven to get some soda pop or run into the grocery store to get whipped cream for the pumpkin pie or, or whatever it is. You know, we can't promise anybody's got any extra time left on the earth. And our job is to be ambassadors and help people be reconcil reconciled. And here's what we know. God is holy. And you do things his way or you don't make it. In other words, if, if you had to write down like little notes out in the margin and say, what have I learned from Nadab and Abihu? Well, I've learned that uh, doing things God's way is deadly serious. And what's doing things God's way in this administration? It's saying, I believe in Jesus. I confess him as Lord. And I believe God raised him from the dead. And then bang, just like that. Holy Spirit sealed, you're sealed Holy Spirit, you're given everlasting life, somebody else paid for it. It's, it's not really difficult. But people get prideful, just like Nadab and Abihu, and they find reasons to reject Christ. And, um, and the, the lesson again from Nadab and Abihu people, how many times in my life have I heard people say, oh, pfft, you know, God's a loving God, and I, I've been I've been a good person. I, I think I'll do fine on the day of judgment. That's very dangerous thinking. You know, there's there's this the, the sin offering, according to 2 Corinthians, is Jesus Christ. We learn from Leviticus: if you want to approach God, you approach him with approach offering. Christ is the sin offering that allows us to approach God. And so let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, please. And Hebrews chapter 10, and verse, starting in verse 19, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter into the holy places by the blood of Jesus. See, when you walk into the presence of God, you're carrying that approach offering, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, holy places by the blood of Jesus, verse 20, by the way that he has dedicated to us a newly made and living way. And it really is that Jesus Christ made it. It was new in our administration through the veil that is to say, his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, now, verse 22, where we're approaching with our approach offering, let us draw near with a true heart. See, back to Hebrews 4, the, the, uh, the frankness of speech, honesty of speech, 
Here it says, let's draw near with a true heart in full assurance of trust, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from an evil conscience. And that's right. You know, do we screw up? Yeah, but you don't have to have a bad conscience about it unless you're doing it all the time on purpose, in which case you ought to work on, on what you're doing a little bit. But, um, but here, you know, Jesus Christ just cleanses us and having our body washed with clean water. And then again, like it said in Hebrews 4, let us hold fir on firmly to the confession of our hope without waving, wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And then it goes on to what do we do with this? When do we walk into God's presence? We think of other people, uh, just like the ambassadors who think of other people here. Let us consider one another to spur one another on to love and good works, not abandoning our meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but exhorting one another. And all the more as you see the day, meaning the, the day of the return of the Lord and the day of judgment drawing near. And so what I wanted to share as we went into this Thanksgiving week is just what an amazing privilege it is that Jesus Christ is our approach offering. He is the sin offering who died for our sins. We have Christ in us. We approach God here. We draw near with a true heart, Hebrews 4. We draw near to the throne of grace with boldness and for, with frankness and honesty of speech. Um, and then we do exactly what it says to do here in Hebrews, that we turn our eyes to other people and just see who can we help and how can we help them. So that's what I wanted to share tonight, and I appreciate your attention here as we go into Thanksgiving week, and God bless you all.